No matter how much anti-fouling you have, over time, every ship ends up with some sort of growth on the bottom of its hull, be it plant life or even animals such as barnacles. Not only does it look unsightly, but by increasing the resistance between the hull and the surrounding water, it can have a dramatic impact on a ship's fuel consumption, which has a knock-on environmental impact in terms of emissions and a financial impact on the ship's operator. All in all, there is quite an incentive to make sure the bottom of your hull stays clean, and we haven't even touched on things like damage to the hull itself caused by said organisms. So, what can a ship owner do? On small boats, you might find the skipper going for a swim with a scrubbing brush to give the hull a good clean, but that's clearly not an option on a 100,000 ton commercial vessel. The size makes it practically quite difficult, and the growth itself makes it environmentally rather dangerous. Anything you scrub off, be it weeds, creatures, or even small bits of the anti-fouling itself, will end up in the harbour's water. We saw in the last video what sort of issues that can cause. The only way you can clean a ship whilst afloat is to catch any debris with some sort of vacuum cleaner. One of the more practical solutions is a magnetic robot cleaner that jet washes the hull as it passes over, sucking all the debris into a huge pipe and collecting it on a barge. Even though systems like that work, a lot of ports still place restrictions on hull cleaning within their jurisdiction, leaving a lot of ship owners with only one real option, dry dock. Commercial ships have to go to dry dock periodically anyway to remain in compliance with all their international obligations. You're usually looking at about once every five years. It gives you a chance to do all sorts of maintenance on the parts of the ship that are usually submerged. Propellers, rudders, thrusters, seacocks, and of course the anti-fouling itself. Dry docking is one of those things that looks simple but is actually a lot more complicated than it first seems. Maneuvering into the dock is like a very precise version of regular berthing. Instead of just placing the ship alongside a key close enough to work cargo, you need to line up with submerged blocks underneath the hull. It's incredibly hard to do it in one go, which is why ships enter dry dock trimmed slightly by the stern. The idea is that you line up the stern and then you can swing the bow a little bit as the ship's keel drops down onto the rest of the blocks. But this creates another somewhat potentially more problematic issue. In a lot of my videos, you'll have seen how form stability works. As a ship leans over, the movement of the centre of buoyancy creates a turning lever righting the vessel. The magnitude of the force is dependent on the distance between G and M. Essentially, a ship's stability is dependent on the location of its centre of gravity. The higher it is, the less stable the ship is. So what happens as you enter dry dock with a little stern trim? While the ship floats, it's all normal, but as soon as the stern touches the first block, things start to happen. The weight of the ship pushes down, so the block exerts an equal and opposite force pushing up on the ship. We call this the P force. At the precise moment of contact, you've still got the force of buoyancy pushing up through the centre of buoyancy, and you've still got the weight of the ship pushing down through the centre of gravity. But instantaneously, the P force appears and starts exerting an upward force at the location of the aft block. As P is pushing up, less buoyancy is needed, so the magnitude of B reduces at the same rate that P increases. Going back to our head-on view, we can visualise what happens to the ship's stability. We now have two forces acting upright. If the ship leans slightly, the buoyancy force still moves to the side, trying to right the vessel, but we now also have this P force that doesn't move. Focusing in on P and G, you can see that a capsizing moment is actually created. As the location of P and the location of G are effectively fixed though, we can combine them. We just add their vectors together, effectively treating P as a negative mass. The centre of gravity appears to move upwards, and its magnitude reduces at the same rate that the magnitude of the buoyancy force reduces. Remember, moving the centre of gravity higher makes the ship less stable and easier to capsize. We can see the extreme limit of this situation in the side profile. As the water drops away, the P-force continues to increase, right up until the point where the ship is completely level and she lands on the blocks along the full length of her hull. Suddenly, P is distributed across all the blocks, and the ship should have all the support she needs. When sailors are planning a dry dock, they know that the P-force is going to be at its maximum value, just as the ship becomes level. 
the greater your stern trim as you enter the dock, the greater the p-force that will be needed to level the ship. This is why a dry dock plan will stipulate the maximum trim of the vessel. It will also tell you the maximum height of your centre of gravity so that you can be sure that when the p-force kicks in, you will still have sufficient stability to land safely. Of course, it's not just dry docking where this principle applies. Do you remember the Costa Concordia? Well, not a lot of people realise, but the same thing happened there. As soon as the hull touched the bottom, effectively a negative mass appeared at the point of contact, creating a virtual rise in the centre of gravity, helping her to capsize. Anyway, back to dry docking. We've strayed off topic a little now, but the key thing is that the ship is safely in the dock, where workers can easily get to the outside of the hull. All the growth can be pressure washed and safely collected so that it doesn't get into the local water. Any damage to the hull can be repaired and new anti-fouling applied before the ship refloats. All those forces that we talked about a minute ago happen in reverse for refloating. The critical period starts as soon as the bow lifts off the blocks and ends when the stern lifts clear. And that brings us to the end of today's video. If you haven't already seen it, I recommend you next watch this video about invasive species where you'll see what happens if you release all these organisms straight into the water. Until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.